Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here to listen to me prattle on a little bit. Um, before we get started, I'd love to bring attention to two things. First of all, the reason I'm wearing a hat is because I totally want us to pretend that my hair still looks like that. <laughs> and two, um, borrowing from Josephine, I'd, I'd love to invite you to tweet at me, Senor Huidobro. I couldn't do the little enye on it. So, and putting an I in there would have made me senior Huidobro. <laughs> So um, please, you know, tell me your story. Tell me about if you've done teaching before, how that's gone. Tell me about your learning. Tell me about how you use computers when you were a child. I'd love to hear all of this. So please feel free to, 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 to bombard me as we go along. So um, yes, my name is Ramon. Um, don't worry about rolling your R. Ramon is just fine. Um, uh, in order to tell you a little bit of my story, we're going to jump back in time. Uh, five years into the past, to the year 2012. And um, ignore me, look at this person. This here is uh, Ramon from five years ago. So I'm going to ask him, Ramon from the past, please introduce yourself to the nice people. <laughs> now, uh, Ramon, please tell us, tell us all a little bit about yourself. OK, you're going to have to forgive him. He's a little shy. I'll go ahead. So don't let his appearance fool you, by the way. Ramon from the past is happy. Uh, for the last two years, he got super lucky and landed a job uh, doing freelance uh, Mac OS software development. He's using a little bit of the Ruby programming language in his tool chain. And he's having a really fun time doing so. And he um, enjoys it, maybe a little too much. And um, despite all this, though, Ramon started feeling a little itch at around this time. He started you know, learning about communities. He started hearing about meetups. He started learning about workshops, and Rails girls, and all this other cool stuff that he would love to contribute to. But uh, Ramon does not feel like he's up to it, just because he doesn't feel good enough. Um, and he was never really good at the whole online discourse thing. For some reason, chat rooms and stuff kind of put him off a little bit. He felt a little shy there, too. So um, that doesn't mean he didn't try. So. Um, uh, when he started getting that itch, he uh, went to a local meetup. Can't remember what at this point anymore. And uh, immediately when he went to this meetup in, here in Vienna, he felt a little bit, a little bit, uh, very much out of place. He felt like he was surrounded by these people who knew so much about a programming language or a computer system. And they were so intense and talking about these deep things that Ramon had never heard about. And in the middle of a discussion of which text editor is better, Vim or Emacs, he kind of freaked out and just said, yeah, I'm, I'm, he kind of shyly ducked out, went back to his hobbit hole, and felt pretty rotten that day. And um, he realized, I, I'm not ready for this. So what did Ramon do? He thought, well, if I can't contribute, if I don't feel ready to contribute, why don't I offer my perspective to introduce people to programming? And so him and his, at the time, girlfriend, Birgit, started an after-school activity called computer game programming, right? And it's been five years, almost over five years now of doing this. It's been a blast. Uh, we're doing this with uh, 10 to 11-year-olds at the Vienna International School, the school that I went to. And uh, they've been super kind in lending us computers and children to experiment on. And, uh, and the kids are cool. They're diverse. Um, we get a lot of, uh, we, I think on one or two years, we had more girls than boys. And their perspective is, I mean, the, the kids' perspective is just incredible. And their imagination, I don't even need to tell you. My favorite example of a game that somebody made, this one girl, I think it was three or four years ago, she made a game where you play as a, and I think I got this right, a space ferret defending Earth from evil lobsters. <laughs> By the way, if I'm going too fast, please, I get excited. <laughs> right. So the aim of computer game programming, I, I tell myself every year, kids, I want you all to feel cool. I want you to feel like hackers, right? And then they all start giggling and saying, oh, yeah, I'm going to you know, hack your Facebook, hack your Instagram, hack your Snapchat, um, and so on. And, uh, and I tell them, oh, hold on. When I mean hackers, I don't mean the person in the business suit with the ski mask, you know, stealing your ones and zeros from your bank account. I mean a hacker in a, in a more broader sense that someone who's clever and can solve problems. So anyway, we, every year we do this for um, 
once a week for about an hour uh, using a, we do this with the, uh, we used to do this with the Ruby programming language and a framework called Gosu, which is super fun. Uh, I recommend checking it out if you're, if you're at any skill, skill level, really. And uh, it's, and the kids love it and I love it, but when I started, right? Now, there's all these books and talks and materials to help you get it started in teaching kids to code. There's a lot of great materials of that. And myself, being myself, instead of doing all that, I just jumped right in and I started doing it. And uh, I, a lot of challenges came from that. You know, I mean, there's some pretty, pretty, simp uh, pretty obvious challenges, like for the, fa for the fact, for example, that this is an after school activity, right? It's like three, four in the afternoon. The kids are probably tired. I'm competing with math. I'm competing with PE. I'm competing with all kinds of subjects to keep them interested. And um, sometimes retaining that knowledge between weeks can be a challenge. Now, you would probably say to, self, to yourself, well, why not give them stuff to do at home, right? Like homework. Now, let me tell you, an after school activity offering homework to kids, not going to happen. The other, the other problem is uh, a little bit more personal one. I'm, I'm maybe a little sensitive. And uh, halfway through the year, the kids would get the option to either continue with us or to jump to another activity. You know, it's summer semester. They're probably going to go and do something like sports. And, or they just realize that they don't like my, the activity. And that's fine, but it still kills me a little. Um, it just, just because I feel like I've failed them or that I'm not doing it right. But even if not now, I, I, I've come, to, I've come to, to terms with the fact that if, if it's not going to work out now, it's going to work out later. Maybe I've planted a seed that will blossom into a later interest in life. You know, be it uh, a career in software development, maybe have it be a skill to help automate, automate things at work, at work and become that person in the office who knows everything, uh, who knows how to do th cool things with the computer. And that's, that's handy. And if I'm doing that, maybe I am contributing. So. I'm just going to go over some of the things that I've learned um, teaching kids to code and how they've benefited me and how I, I think you, you can be inspired by this to try your own ways of teaching, not necessarily just in software development. So our first point, um, before I get into this, I'm going to make it very clear. If there is a group of people out there who's good at breaking things, it's children. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Let me give you an example. So we're making a, 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 a two-dimensional two game where you're a, a ship in space dodging asteroids on their way down. And the kids would ask us, what's a good speed? You know? And I tell them something like, oh, 30 units, 40 units is good. And they say, OK. And then they make something insane. <laughs> um, same goes for, say, enemy placement. They'd ask me, how many enemies? Should I put on the screen? I tell them, you know, something like four, five. That's that's a good amount. Thinking to myself, I'm being clever here because I know they're going to probably double it and make it something like ten, right? No, no, you'd be surprised. <laughs> you'd be surprised at how resilient, how insistent they are in hitting that number nine. <laughs> <laughs> or say, if we're making a, a two-dimensional jump and run game, something like. Super Mario Brothers or Sonic the Hedgehog or something like this. And they'd ask me, OK, how, how high should my character be able to jump? I, I mean, you get the idea at this point. <laughs> and at the beginning, this used to kind of annoy me because I was like, this, isn't, this is a disaster. They're making these broken games that don't work. And they're just, comp they're just you know. But I don't realize that in the background, they're laughing. They're having so much fun. And they're like, look at how broken everything is. And they <laughs> grab their laptops and go over to the buddy. He's like, hey, hey, check this out. It's a disaster. <laughs> and you know, I gave this some thought. And I, 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 I came to realize that, that having this fun, being able to, to break things, it's, it's pretty cool. You know, that's, that's when, I, when, I make, when I'm working on software, I will, instead of, maybe sometimes I tend to jump the gun, and I will just like try something out. And if it breaks, OK, it didn't work. But I learned. And that's, that's, that's helpful. Like, I, I, that's something we need to remember. And besides, the kids then learn that maybe having 100,000 characters on screen is probably not going to work. Having fun is important. It keeps you going. 
So let's move on to the next point, appreciating that which I take for granted. When I, when I, when I started teaching the kids to code, I thought, you know, this is going to be super simple. You know, I, I learned it, and it was super easy. I completely faded memory. So here's a piece of code. Um, it defines the variable name as Anna. And then I would ask, and then it would print out the variable uh, name. And I'd ask the kids, OK, so what does this piece of code do? And they would correctly say, yeah, it prints out Anna. And I'd be like, very good. And then I'd said, OK, now let's try this. What does this piece of code do? First it prints out the variable name, and then it defines the name as Anna. And they tell me it, defined, it prints out the name Anna. But that's not the case. What this does is print out an error that there's no value for name. And that's because I completely overlooked to tell them that the code works line by line. And so I thought, OK, check it out, kids. See, see, like a book, right? It goes from beginning to end. You read word by word, sentence by sentence. And so the story has a very linear progression. And one of the girls, she piped up and she said, well, actually, Ramon, have you ever read one of those choose your own adventure books? What you do is you get to the end of a passage and it says, if you want to turn left, turn, go to page 15. If you want to go right, turn to page 56. I didn't have an answer. <laughs> I'll give you another example. Um, don't worry too much about the content here. What's going on is that we're having a, a window for our game, giving it a height and a width. And we initialize it with a background and a player to move around in. And a kid, and then we draw it in those two methods. And a kid comes up to me and says, Ramon, this doesn't work. My background's not drawing. Now, immediately I said, well, of course, you defined the draw method twice. This isn't going to work. It's only going to take the latter definition. You can't overload methods in Ruby. And I thought, that's that. Until the kid, she said, why not? <laughs> And I didn't know what to say. <laughs> and there are programming languages that allow you that, to do this sort of thing. And that is a good thing to have. So um, my final example of this is uh, when we've been working with Ruby for a while, we were doing some text adventure kind of games where you'd be like, you find yourself in the dungeon. You see a flask, get E flask, that sort of thing. And then it was time for graphics. And this was always good for me because it's so exciting and shiny. It'd be like, check it out, everyone. This is the Super Game 4000. And I'd explain to them how coordinates work. You have your character with an x coordinate along the horizontal axis and a y coordinate along the vertical axis. And then I'd said when those values of 0, the origin is at the top left. And when my kids interrupt me, she says, no, 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 no. This, is, this isn't. This doesn't make sense. I learned in math that it should be at the bottom left. Why are you programmers doing it this way? <laughs> I, I had no idea. And a research paper I read, my notes aren't here, I'm sorry. Um, it told me that, um, it told me that a oh, difficulty that some teachers encounter when teaching to code is this, is this fear of not knowing answers to some questions. And I, I, I keep reminding myself that it's OK not to have all the answers, especially today when you have Google on your phone. In five seconds, my phone's not there. Um, <laughs> uh, and, but anyway, I went home. Uh, if you're curious to the reason why we do this, is because back in the old days, you know, the big cathode ray, cathode ray tube CRT monitors, they would render images from top to bottom one pixel from left to right at a time, row, row, row. So it makes sense to have the origin at the top left, which is neat. I didn't know that. And the kids were pretty impressed as well. Now, again, with this whole appreciating what I take for granted thing, right? I, would, uh, I thought I could just explain a concept to the kids and expect them to understand it immediately and go away and do it. So I'd tell them, hey, OK, everybody, today I'm going to teach you what a list or an array is. You know, it's a set of enemies that you can have on the screen, and you can manipulate them all at once. And it's super easy, and it's super fun. Go do it. Of course, I, was, I, I explained it better than that. But the point was still, eh, what do I do now? They didn't, they, even though they understood what I was talking about, and they understood the concept of it, 
I still need, we still needed to cement the idea of how to do it. And so Bigot came up with the idea of having at, every, at the start of every session a little exercise round where we would say, OK, before we get started, let's do these tiny little snippets. Make an array with 50 enemies. Add an enemy to that array, and so on and so forth. And while this helped, at the beginning, the kids were like, I just want to make my shiny graphics and explosions. But after a while, they would start getting excited. It became a competition. They'd start being like, I'm going to beat you, Ramon. I'm going I'm to answer the question before you even ask it. Which, by the way, was effective. And it reminded me that even though my skills aren't that great to start with at anything, I do have to practice. And I will get better. Quick side note, uh, these drawings are, none of these drawings are by me, and I cannot draw to save my life. But that's not relevant. <laughs> Next up uh, is, is, this, is this notion of simplicity, uh, and how it's, if something is simple, it doesn't mean necessarily that it's easy to understand. So, but I, what I mean is, I'll show you an example here. This is um, a piece of code where every time the window updates, the player character will move five pixels to the right. We will take its x coordinate and move it five over. And that will be called continuously to make it look like the character is moving five pixels per refresh. And the kids are like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I can use that. And then I'm like, OK. okay. Now prepare to be blown away. Check this out, I'd say. Huh? Isn't that great? Look at, how, look at how much simpler that is. These kids feel comfortable enough with me to tell me that they say, no, 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 I don't like that. I like the other way more. <laughs> and, and I'd say, well, maybe it's just you. How about the rest? And they'd be like, no, I prefer the top one. Which stumped me a little, because we, uh, sometimes, I get, sometimes I get the feeling that as, pro, as programmers, having something simple like this, it looks nice in a programming sense, but it's maybe not as clear what it does. What this does, by the way, is either move the character five pixels to the left or have it hang on to the right side of the screen, uh, left side of the screen. And maybe sometimes how verbosity, having something that is a little more text, maybe sometimes that's a little clearer to another programmer what your intention is. And that's important to remember. Yeah? Sorry, I might. Sorry about that. Um, right. This, this next point about showing and reading code and its importance, it's, this, one, this one really got to me out of nowhere. So I'm going to ask you to, to, to imagine with me a little bit, right? It's like halfway through the session, right? Half the games are not working. There's bugs everywhere. There's kids going, Ramon, Ramon, I don't know what was wrong with my code. And I'm like, oh god. Um, let me, let me, let me, let me. Let me see if I can take a look. OK, yeah, I, I, there's a bug in there. Try, why don't you try and fix it? And they'd be like, oh, come on. Can't you just, can't you just fix it this one time for me? And I'm like, OK, fine. Because there's other kids going like, eh. And I'm like, OK, I fix it. What happened? That happened again, where I fixed it for them that one time. And after a while, I had created a little culture where every time there was a bug, the kid would basically throw up their hands and be like, this is broken. <laughs> it doesn't work. And I was, appalled. I, was, I was shocked by this. Had I created a group of lazy people by accident? This was not my intention. Uh, so I'll, I'll show you a last piece of code for today. Um, this piece of code is broken, right? And looking, looking at it, a kid would tell me it was broken. And I'd be like, OK. And there was another kid, perhaps, who had their code working. They were done. So I said, hey. You want to come over? And she would come over and have a look. And she'd be like, oh, well, of course it's broken. There's an end missing right there. After a couple times of doing this, I didn't even need to ask them anymore. And some, when some kid would be like, it's broken, another kid would come running over and be like, I'll fix this for you. After a while, they were working together. In, 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 in professional software development, this is known as pair programming, right? Where one person is at the computer, and the other one is looking, over their, uh, looking at the same code and, and giving them advice as they go. And this happened naturally, right? I was blown away by this. <laughs> because not only was 
what were these people helping each other? They're reading each other's code. I'm doing the same. I'm looking at different perspectives. And being able to work in, in twos, I mean, it happened naturally. It has to pre be something good, right? Our last point today is about um, managing expectations. And what I mean by this is that on the, the winter semester starts in um, September, late September, and the kids come in and they say, all right, I'm going to make the greatest Batman game ever. It's going to be 3D and it's going to have all the bells and whistles you'd ever need and it's going to be the best-selling game of history. Now, after a while, they realize these expectations are probably not in line with what they will be able to do, but that doesn't mean that they're discouraged. They make their own Batman game and they make it great because then you play, they make a game where you play as Batman fighting uh, Garnet from Steven Universe, right? And they're having a blast. And the same goes for us, the same goes for me. I think to myself, another project? Sure, what a good idea. I could, I've, there's 12 hours where I'm awake, every, well, something like 12 hours where I'm awake every day. I can manage it, right? Um, <laughs> what I, what I really picked up from all of this, the most important thing, and I, that I, something I hope to inspire in everybody, is this notion of, of confidence. That you know, the kids, they looked up to me, and, and they looked up to Bigot, and, and we, were, we were friends, and we got along so well. So I'll tell you a little bit about what happened after we started doing this activity. Myself, um, like a year later, I, kicked, I went out of my hobbit hole, I kicked back the tears, and I went to my first ever meetup, and it was great. Uh, I started coaching at Rails Girls workshops, uh, teaching, introducing uh, women in, in tech to, to be able to, to code, and that was also amazing, and I highly recommend it. Uh, you don't need to have a high level of skill to be able to do it, by the way. Uh, I thought to myself, me speaking at a conference, what a silly idea, and yet here I am. <laughs> um, and I've started working with other people as well. Uh, my sister, Pilar, she's in the organizing he team here today, and her, her buddy Shelly, we, we did the Rails Girl Summer of Code together, and that was super fun. I was their coach, and they learned, they basically got, used that uh, summer to learn everything they know about coding and develop their careers further as they go. So you're probably wondering, what about the kids? Well, given that it's been five years now, we got some kids that are 15 or 16, and they're making games in something called the Unity 3D engine, which is for making 3D games. And they're using uh, JavaScript to, to, to program their games. And occasionally, I'll still get a, Steam, a message on Steam from one of them where they'll say, you're going to tell me that I need to put a semicolon at the end of every line? <laughs> they're doing great. Uh, one of them is also making uh, an environment awareness uh, game for their school and they're presenting it, I, I'm, I'm, it's amazing. I highly encourage you to go and teach anyone. And it doesn't have to be programming. And it doesn't have to be kids. you know. But if you are interested in teaching kids to code, I've got, there's some pretty great resources. There's um, Coding Do Coder Dojo. There's Kids Ruby. Um, there's Rails Girls. There's the Rails Girls Summer of Code. There's uh, Hello Ru uh, Sonic Pi. Yeah. There's Sonic Pi, which is for teaching um, programming with music which is pretty sweet. Uh, there's a Hello Ruby book, uh, which is also a lot of fun. I, you know, as, as these materials become more and more available by us and by, and by you and by everyone, it, teaching is so liberating and it's so uh, inspiring. I highly recommend it. So I'm just going to quickly wrap up by thanking my wife, Birgit, my sister, Pilar, for their incredible drawings. I'm going to thank Women Tech Makers for letting me speak here today. And I'm going to thank you for listening and take your questions.